Hi students, a really good question popped up in regards to ionization energy. So first, I'd like to tell you what the question was. The question was, why is it easier to remove an electron from oxygen than nitrogen? So basically, why does oxygen have a lower ionization energy than nitrogen? So the confusion is because of the, the general trend. Now, First, let me define what ionization energy is. Ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron from an atom or an ion in a gaseous state. But to make it easy, it's the amount of energy required to remove an electron. So typically, the farther away the electron is from the nucleus, the easier it is to pull away the electron. So you can just think of magnets as magnets are further apart, it's easier to pull them apart. When they're closer, they stick more, right? So I'm using that concept where the electrons are attracted to the positively charged nucleus. So as they're closer, it's harder to pull them away. As they get farther away, it's easier. So as we go down a group, so as I go down a column on the periodic table, the valence shell is farther away. It's in a farther energy level, principal energy level. As I go left to right, I'm in the same energy level, but now I have more protons in the nucleus. So those protons have a greater pull on those electrons in that energy level. So the basic trend is ionization energy increases as I go down, or decreases as I go down, and increases as I go left to right. So when we were to look at this basic chart that is on your PowerPoints. If you look at ionization energy, right? If I start at group 8A, okay, the noble gases, I see that helium is only in the first energy level, right? It's valence shell, and neon's valence shell, where the electrons would be removed, is in the second energy level. And then argon is in the third, krypton, and so on. And the general trend is as I go down the noble gases, 8A, right, the ionization energy decreases. It's easier to remove electrons from xenon than hydrogen or helium because its valence shell is further away from the nucleus, just like it is easier to pull magnets away as they're further apart. I can also see as I go left to right across a period, so now, instead of going down a group, as I go left to right, so let's say period two, I start with lithium and I go all the way to neon, the ionization energy increases because the atom's getting smaller because for that energy level, there's a greater, what's called effective nuclear charge. There's more protons in that nucleus pulling on those electrons in that outer shell. But what I want you to look at very carefully is this is a trend and there's always exceptions. And you can see quite clearly there's a little dip right here. You go one, two, it looks like 3A, 4A, 5A, and then again at 6A, 7A, A, 8A. So it looks like at 3A and 6A there's these little dips. And you can see it, right? So the question is, why is oxygen, which is group 6A, lower in ionization energy than nitrogen? And that's a really good question. So we can see right here are the values. And again, the general trend is ionization energy increases as we go left to right, right? It decreases as we go down a group. So again, it's harder to remove an electron from helium than it is xenon. Why? Xenon's outer shell is very far away from its nucleus, so it's easier to pull that electron away. Helium is smaller. The electrons are close, it's harder to pull them away. As I go left to right, this first energy level only has two electrons, but hydrogen only has one proton pulling on the electrons in that energy level. Helium has two. So two positive charge, right, pulls better on an electron than one. So that's why helium is harder to pull an electron away. But again, we see it 3a, there's this little dip going from 2a to 3a, and then it goes back up. And then 5a, and then 6a, there's a dip, and then it goes back up. Why? 
That's why I love orbital, orbital diagrams. The orbital diagrams help explain that dip. So beryllium is 2a, boron is 3a. And when we look at the orbital diagram, we notice that beryllium is really happy because it has its 1s energy sublevel filled and it has its 2s sublevel filled. Boron, on the other hand, it also has its sublevels filled, 1s and the 2s, but it has this one lone 2p electron. Okay? If we look at nitrogen and we compare it to oxygen, right? So this is from beryllium 2a to 3a. If we look at nitrogen to oxygen, 5a to 6a, we notice that the nitrogen, it's really happy. Its 2p sublevel is half filled and all the electrons are parallel. When I go to oxygen, right, we see in nitrogen all these orbitals, the px, py, pz, are half-filled orbitals because they followed Hund's rule, which is an electron is going to minimize repulsion by going to an empty orbital rather than a half-filled one. When we get to oxygen, there's one more electron going in the 2p sublevel. So it has to go in an anti-parallel position in an already occupied orbital. So what I want you to think about is these orbitals and these sublevels, whether they be P, S, or D, they like to first be all the way filled, halfway filled, like this 2P in nitrogen, or all the way empty. Okay? Now, why is that important? Well, if I look at beryllium and I compare it to boron, okay, with beryllium, it has a 2s and a 1s sublevel filled. If I remove an electron from beryllium, I'm now breaking up a full sublevel. Beryllium doesn't want to do that. It's got a filled 2s sublevel. It doesn't want to do that. If I go to boron, if I remove the one electron from boron, what happens? Well, it still has a 1s and a 2s filled sublevel. And I just now have an empty 2p. But I wasn't close to being halfway filled or all the way filled prior to removing this electron. So it is willing to lose it a little bit. If I go to the comparison of oxygen and nitrogen. So if I look, right now nitrogen's pretty content. It has a half filled 2p. If I remove an electron from nitrogen, now I break up that half-filled sublevel. If I look at oxygen, it's got this one odd anti-parallel electron that's in a full orbital. But if I remove that one electron, what do I get? I get a half-full sublevel, and that requires less energy to remove than a completely full one in the case of nitrogen. So that's basically the explanation. You're going to use orbital diagrams to help you understand that most of the trends are correct. Most of the trends are correct. However, there's always exceptions. That's what these little dips are. So the orbital diagrams really help me understand the exceptions because what the orbital diagrams do is make me understand, and this is why they're better than the electron configurations, that sublevels like to be all the way filled, halfway filled, or all the way empty. By removing boron's 1, 2p electron, it's now going to make an empty 2p. By removing oxygen's anti-parallel electron in this 2p orbital, it's then going to make a half-filled 2p. So that's why those ionization energies are lower than beryllium and nitrogen. And then we see that it goes back up, right? So here's lithium, beryllium, boron, right? It's a little bit lower. Why? We're getting rid of that 2p1, but then it pops back up again. And then we go to carbon, nitrogen, and then it drops down for oxygen, but then for fluorine, it drops back up, and then we go to neon. 
So I hope that helps you guys understand. And yes, there are always exceptions to trends. Trends are trends. They're not always set in stone. There's always some exceptions. So I hope you guys make sense of that. I hope you appreciate it. And uh, thanks for asking a great question for him.